So welcome to the Gratitude for Time podcast. This is our sixth episode. And our guest today is Katrin Hertuin. She's the CEO of Elec Nano, which is a men's and women's designer shoe company, I believe. Correct? I have that? Yes. Okay. Um, and from what I can find on the internet, you have a master's degree in nanoscience and um, nanotechnology. I saw that you got a PhD, but it didn't really like tell me what it was for or where it was from. So can you kind of finish that for me? Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, I have an, a background in engineering, electrical engineering and material sciences, and then I did a master's in nanoscience and nanotechnology. And after that, um, I worked for four years as a, as a doctoral researcher at the Department of Solid State Physics and Magnetism. So it was really wow. research in nanophysics. Um, I was working on the metabolization of biomolecules to create wow. biodegradable circuits. Okay, that is very cool. Um, before we kind of jump into that, can you kind of give everybody a, a little brief background about yourself, kind of like maybe starting from where you were born and how you came to be here, um, just so people can have a better understanding? Sure. Um, I was born and I'm raised uh, in Belgium, um, so country in Europe. Uh, I was born at the end of the 80s um, and Grew up there with one sister, both parents uh, didn't really have a difficult childhood or anything. Um, I have a lot of degrees, mostly because Belgium is a country that allows you to get all those degrees without um, having to pay too much for it. We have a great social security system um, and, and free education. Um, so even after um, having a master's degree in got, getting a master's degree in nanoscience, and nanotechnology, I studied footwear design as well to also get a degree in, in arts. Um, and to then combine all of those from a very young age, I had a passion for both for science and technology and for footwear in particular, fashion in general, was always obsessed with shoes, um, would build a little shoe store in front of the garage as a little girl. Uh, my dream job was really to sell shoes. Uh, both of my parents are, are scientists, so they didn't really see why, why mm -hmm. you would want to do that. But I was very passionate about shoes as a kid. And then with age, the interest in science and technology came in. And pretty much after graduating as an engineer, I somehow had the feeling that I needed to keep combining both of them, that I didn't want to let either passion go. Whereas if you look at the general theme of how to build your career or where to do it you kind of have to do either or you choose the fashion industry or you choose um the tech industry and so i kind of want i didn't want to let go of either so that's why i started my own company um in fashion tech basically to combine the two that's that is really cool and it just sounds very authentic and genuine um can you kind of describe for us how you kind of came from Belgium to coming out to like the Bay Area and kind of that process a little bit. Um, yeah. yeah, sure. Um, so I started my own company in 2014 um, and it was purely a footwear brand, really. We integrated um, nanotechnology, but other engineering techniques in the footwear that we created. For men and women, we have commercial collections that are on the market that are sold, um, they're produced in Italy. But very early on when I was going to fashion weeks, uh, we always would, we would definitely go to Milan fashion week, some of the others as well. But as I kept going there, other companies, other brands came to me asking, we want to integrate technology as well, but we don't know where to start. We don't know where to go. We don't really know how to communicate with a tech company and vice versa. Tech companies came to me asking, how can we integrate um, or create something that goes beyond the, the prototype that all the engineers like? We now want to create something for a general audience or an audience that is not that techie. Um, so it kind of happened naturally uh, being at trade shows and events. Uh, so I started 
doing consulting, uh, so build a consulting branch within the company as well um, to help other companies do the same bridge the gap between technology and um, fashion. And that led me to receive a grant in 2017 from the Belgian royal family uh, to gain international business experience, to really go outside of, of Europe um, and, and expand the business. And you could choose with the grant, you can go anywhere in the world uh, as long as it's outside of Europe. And so I ended up choosing um, the San Francisco Bay Area. For a very long time, I debated between going to Asia, like Japan or Tokyo, um, or San Francisco. And in the end, I decided to go to San Francisco, definitely not for the fashionable part, but totally <laughs> for the tech part. Um, and I haven't regretted since. I mean, it was a grant for one year. Um, but after that, I had built contacts network to keep working with companies that are based there, uh, discovering new technologies and kind of took it from there. And so that's now almost four years ago. So that's how I ended up in, in California. Wow. That's, that's really cool. It's, it's cool that they do that. They have like this fund that is for like gaining international experience. Um, there are some advantages of having a royal family. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was a, is so. It's literally like the royal family of Belgium. Like yes, yeah. So we have a royal family. We have a king and a queen. Um, and years ago, I think it's more than fifty years old uh, that the fund was started. It's for um, young, high potentials, as they say, under 30, every year they give 20 Belgians a grant like that under 30 to um, go outside. It's a tiny country. So they try to make as much connections with the outside world. And since we're central in Europe, the connection with other countries in Europe is pretty strong. Uh, but outside of that, I mean, a lot of Americans, I'm sure, don't even know what Belgium is, whether it's a country or a city. And it's no surprise, it is a very small country the population is the size of the san francisco bay area so it's just yeah. uh not very significant on a global scale um so that's well, why it's it's for them also interesting to give something like that 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 is funny i mean it it, it is like the home of a lot of international entities though i would say right yes because of its central location in mm -hmm. uh, in europe yes hmm. interesting um, and can you kind of just give us the, the layman's version of like what role the nanotechnology plays in your like shoe designs and all of that? Yes. Um, so for people that are less familiar with nanotechnology, uh, a nanometer compares to a meter, like the diameter of a blueberry compares to the diameter of the earth. So it's very, very tiny. And the things that take place at that scale um, are different from the things that we know at macro scale. So if you know an apple falls from the tree, that's not true at the nano scale. So there are new rules uh, for physics and chemistry. That's why they build a separate field for that. Um, the nice thing about it is it is that you don't see it, you don't feel it, but it's there. Um, so you can use it to change the properties for the material. And that's why I loved using it for fashion, because I'm not the kind of fashion tech person that wants your clothes to start moving and have flashy lights everywhere. For me, technology, when applied, applied to fashion, should be to enhance it, to make it better. Um, and so for our footwear, we applied the lotus effect. Um, it's named after the lotus flower. Uh, who's known to stay immaculately clean, even in the dirtiest pools. So it has a very smooth surface. If you look at the leaves from with our eyes, what we can see, but if you then look at it on a very small scale, you see tiny little pillars and those make sure that water doesn't get absorbed or um, flattens out on that surface. It really stays on it in its droplet shape and rolls off. So we mimic mm -hmm that on the leather of our shoes. Um, so it's not a chip or anything. It's really the leather as part of the tanning process. We add these tiny little pillars on our surface that are far enough apart so that the leather still is flexible and breathable, but they're close enough together so that the water can't really get to the fibers 
uh, and damaging it in that way. California may be less relevant, but in countries like Belgium or even on the East Coast, some country, uh, some uh, states where you have a lot of rain or unpredictable weather, um, it's nice not to have to worry about your shoes getting dirty or messed up by rain, snow, mud, et cetera. Mm -hmm. That's very true. <laughs> That's really interesting that you're able to I guess, enhance or alter the structure of the material um, at a very like atomic level almost or below that even. Yeah, it's, it's really chemistry. Um, nanotechnology is really present. That same technology is not something that I invented. It's a very well-known effect. Uh, there are some paints uh, for houses and, and uh, the car industry uses it, the glass industry uses it. So it's definitely that idea of having these very small scale structures on a surface are, are common. Um, the problem with leather is that it's not a man-made product in the way that it is still an animal skin. Like fabrics are easier because we actually weave them ourselves um, with every piece of leather is different because there was a different animal in it. Um, so that makes it more challenging um, to do something. But on the other hand, it is a very a durable product um, that has really good qualities. And if it's um, treated properly or maintained properly, it can last for a very, very long time. And that's really the quality since I'm producing high-end uh, shoes that you're supposed to be able to pass on to your grandkids. It makes sense to make sure that that material is, can, can mm -hmm. last as long as possible. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Is there is there any like backlash from like human or uh, animal rights activists or anything for like the leather or other products or anything like that? Um, yeah, of course, it's not a vegan option. It is still <laughs> leather. Um, it does make it the, the idea from or making products that last very long is I mean, there are also a lot of vegetarians and vegans that still use leather products. Um, just because it's uh, the, the it, it's not the meat that you're eating. Uh, it depends on how you use it. The animals that we that uh, where the leather comes from are also like raised in a or, or live in a very nice environment. Uh, they live in Andre in, in France uh, in the outdoors. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I am always open to look for new materials. The problem with leather is that it has such specific qualities um, that it's really hard to mimic, but we're definitely uh, experimenting um, mm -hmm. with other fake leathers, not the plastic types, but really the ones uh, like based on pineapples, cactuses, mushrooms um, that are still in the development process. And a few of them are getting close to really commercialization and bigger brands that are looking at them as well. Um, so definitely looking into it right now, don't really, I occasionally get an email from somebody asking, don't you have a vegan option? Um, we no. don't at the moment. It, it will probably come over time. Sustainability is definitely important to us. Also, when I use a leather, if you ever look at the design of our shoes, it's all tiny little pieces uh, put together. That's really to use as much of the material as possible. Um, if you look at a lot of brands that use leather, they will need one skin for one shoe. Um, just because the design, the patterns that they make, and we really try to optimize to use every single piece of that leather as much as possible and just sew it together it will wrap nicely around your foot and it will limit the amount of waste that you have mm -hmm. that's yeah that also makes sense um i guess kind of shifting gears a little bit here kind of to more like philosophical uh conversation but what is your relationship with shoes um, I, I think it's, um, except for the passion that I have for them and, and that I just always think of them as little pieces of art and engineering combined, because I think they're very pretty, but you also stand on them. They carry you unlike almost anything, um, in, in our, what we have, what we use, sure you eat your food. That's also something that goes into your body, but when it comes 
comes to what we wear, most clothes hang on us, a handbag hangs on our arms, but shoes are really your feet are in them and you um, carry, they carry you. Um, and so I've always thought of that as something interesting from, from a dynamic perspective, from an engineering perspective, but they are also very pretty to me. And then linked to that is that I never liked feet. Um, so just the <laughs> idea of covering them up for me seemed a very noble um, way of, of making things look prettier. Uh, I think that may be a human instinct, um, making, we were attracted to beautiful things. And, and when I see feet, I'm not really like, it's not pretty to me. So I like covering them up and making it prettier. So. That's, that's funny. Uh, and that's been that way since like you were young, huh? Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't come from anywhere. It doesn't run in the family, but I've always had this thing with shoes. We don't really know in the family where it comes from. Um, but I've always been obsessed with them really just looking, being able to look at them. I would sit underneath tables just to look at people's shoes without being distracted by anything else. For me, they were just very interesting. It doesn't even matter if they're really ugly or pretty shoes, just the way that they're wrapped around your feet and they move with your feet. Heels are even more interesting because then mm -hmm. there comes a whole, um, like the dimensions that uh, you have big feet, you have small feet, the proportions that go along with it. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I've always thought it was very interesting. <laughs> yeah, that's, that, that's just funny to hear you talk about feet that way. Um, <laughs> well, now I'm really going to shift gears a little bit because um, this podcast is the purpose of it is to change how people value time and to get people like yourself who people look up to and like you have a lot of influence over a lot of people and not just entrepreneurs, but like women as well, which I think is really important. Um, and so I kind of want to spend some time talking about how you value and how you relate to time. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really because how we value and relate to time influences how we like relate to ourselves, how we treat ourselves, um, how we treat other people, um, our relationships with nature and technology, all of that really hinges on how we value and relate to time. And so yeah, I, I just want to kind of pose one of those to you, at least like you can choose whether it's the value one or the relate one, but um, I guess, how do you relate to time? Um, well, I have to say that I kind of went through, if, if I go back to how I was raised to how I am now, um, I clearly went already through a lot of different stages and, and the way that I relate to it, look at it has definitely changed over time. Um, I was raised in a very punctual way. Like you, you respect time tremendously and your time is less um, important than the time of the person you're dealing with. And from a perspective of children, that also totally makes sense. I mean, it's not that playing and, and going to school is not important, but often as you get older, you have more responsibilities and the time that you have seems just to, to be more precious. Um, you realize it more as well. So as a kid, I was always on time, very punctual. I was more looking at the hour than, than looking at uh, the, what the meaning of time really was. And then when I started studying, it really became a mathematical entity. And, and because my life was so planned, it was very easy to look at it in that way as well. So purely mm -hmm. from what I was studying, time is part of acceleration of speed, of force, of friction um, from physics perspective. And then you have a life that is super organized. So it's very easy. I mean, you go to class, you know when your exams are months in advance. So you can really plan your life and not completely shift it when I um, started my own company. Because then it really, did, it was more about the relationship between having a certain amount of time, the amount of work that you want to fit into that, the money that you have. So it kind of became like a triangle that 
uh, constantly shifted. And, and uh, I have to say, I didn't really enjoy that. I, I love working, um, but I didn't really enjoy that time I'm, since I was raised so much in, in planning um, or, or with the mindset of, of having control over the amount of time that you have and, and um, organizing it. And it kind of shifted when I started working with Italians. Um, so that was the first time that I went outside of that Northern European and American way of considering time as well, where you really just, you have a deadline, you have this amount of time and you respect it. You meet at a certain hour or a day and you respect it. And that's, if somebody doesn't do that, you feel like they don't value your time that much. Um, so for me that shifted when I started working with them and understood that they don't look at it that way. I went there on business trip, the first one or two thinking I can get this done in a day, three hours, a morning, and I had to spend there three days and it's not like they're less efficient or they don't work hard. They just work differently. And the way they use time is very different than what we, how we use it. They put so much more um, in interaction and, and relationship and person in, in how they use their time when it comes to uh, the, the business perspective. So that was the first time that it really, for me, kind of became less about time, work, money, and, and more also, what do I want to do with this time? And, and disconnecting a little bit from time equals also being respectful or, or making sure that you stick to time also equals being respectful to somebody. Um, and then it shifted even more when I started doing international business, because then you kind of go into time zones and then you just look at it from such a far perspective. So um, broadly that what, as I go through a day, I've always lived in Europe where probably almost everyone is in the same time zone. In the US, there is much more difference there already. So if you grow up in that, naturally you have more difference. But for me, almost everyone was always on the same time. So their morning, their lunch and their afternoon and, and how you arrange your work is kind of the same um, and, and your time and what you want to do together and, and where you want to go. And then when you start working internationally, I think everyone who does that knows that you have very long days. You can wake up at five, go to bed at 12 um, or later, and you're just continuously working, but you immediately notice what the, what the influence is. Like when I get up in the morning and I start working at seven, for example, um, and I work with somebody in Europe, they're already at the end of their work there. It's four there. So they have a completely different mindset. And just that kind of dynamic came into looking how I, I relate to time as well as more as a period throughout the day, throughout the year, how I feel about um, how I am in that moment versus uh, another person. So it's less about their, their, it's less about respect towards their time and more about how are they feeling in that time. Hmm. That's interesting. And so you're in Aruba right now. Do you yes. feel or notice any differences in how people either use or relate or value time there? Uh, it's more of the, the Italian mindset as well. I think this can be expected. There is also studies around that showing that certain cultures just look at time in a different way. Um, so it is the more suggestion of a time rather than really strictly following that that nine to five schedule that a lot of northern european um mm -hmm. cultures work in so yeah it's definitely yeah. i have to say when I, I rarely let people know where i am in the world <laughs> because it's changing so much um so for people that i communicate with i i do let them know like i'm in that time zone or that time of day, usually not even I'm in that time zone. I'll, I would say that time of day works best for me. Uh, they don't have to know that I'm still in bed uh, before that. Um, and so it, it does, it confuses people sometimes when, when you're not, because it's maybe unfair because I'm prepared knowing that I'm going to speak to somebody who's in the 
late um, afternoon still meeting with me, whereas I'm in my early morning, still fresh mind uh, working mm -hmm. with them. So that's interesting. That's uh, that's important to keep in mind, actually, because it makes a difference. It and does. I think so. Yeah. Um, and so I guess, I guess the follow-up question, which is very similar, but different is how do you value time? Um, it's, it's a difficult one. Um, I think the, the school way of looking at it in the beginning was really, or when I just started out running a business from me was really, um, how much time do I want to spend on this myself versus how much money am I willing to pay for it? So it was really the balance between time versus money. Mm -hmm. um, if, if I do this myself, uh, how many hours will it take me? Am I willing to pay this amount of money for somebody else to do it for me? I think that's kind of a natural way of going, starting a business when you don't have a ton of funds to, to throw around. Um, now I'm, I'm shifting much more away from that, um, valuing my own time actually more and not stuffing my own time as much anymore with, um, really having to do something. I, maybe it's also just as you grow older. Um, but when I was young, I would really feel guilty, um, younger, I would really feel guilty if I didn't spend every minute of the day working, doing something, studying, doing something valuable, just hanging, I think is also based on how I was raised, was not really something, the downtime was not really something that was worthy. Um, and that is kind of shifting right now because I feel like I need it and, and valuing that time that you don't spend crunching things um, and, and really not putting it next to money, um, not even because often people see it in, in relation to when they work, they say, well, I will make less money if I have more holidays. For me, it's not about that holiday thing. I love what I do. Um, it kind of feels like it doesn't really feel like work. Most of the time I have, I can go from doing really intellectual work to really drawing, to design new things. So it's a very, um, a job with a lot of variation in it, uh, but it's really more about making space in my head just to use time just to sit and not do anything and let my mind rest and and use that way uh, how how I go about through a day about a day that I need that space as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I mean the way I kind of perceive what you're saying in terms of like we're getting older and I guess facing the reality that our time is finite and that it doesn't always like seem necessary to be efficient because you're going to die. <laughs> um, and so it kind of starts to enforce a value on enjoyment, I think, um, or simply just being here and just like enjoying the fact that you're alive, you have time, you're alive, uh, you, like you have a future to possibly look forward to. Um, or even if you don't really, just the fact that you have like that moment um, is really all that you have. And something to be grateful for, I think, but, um, I think it really forces a person to kind of think, okay, if efficiency isn't like the highest value, maybe there's something else that's on that spectrum. And I think it's kind of between efficiency and enjoyment of time. Uh, yes. Yeah. But I mean, I it, it comes into that, like, why, just giving yourself a few, an hour just to sit and do nothing is incredibly valuable and probably productive actually in the long term. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I, I really came from that mindset of, of filling 
every minute, like maybe the perspective is the same, knowing that a time a moment passes and it'll never come back. Like every second that takes mm -hmm. is, is gone. Um, but instead of thinking, I really have to fill this with something that I do that will is, is measurably making me go forward is measurably me making more money, me becoming more successful, me making into more me enjoying my life more, um, being happier, going forward, improving myself other than, than the pure work study, um, more like quantifiable, um, measures. So I guess what are some of your measurements of success for your life or for your time? So when it ends, uh, at some point. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, for me, it's really just being happy. And the way that that materializes is very non-materialistic. Um, so I, I've never... Even, I mean, I run a company and I know from that perspective, you, you're you supposed to make it as successful as possible with as much money as possible. Um, for me, that's not really ever what it's been about because it's what I'm, I'm really just passionate about what I do. And I like to make other people happy with, with the things that I make, that I create. Um, so that's also what, it, it makes me happier to get an email from a customer who bought one pair telling me uh, how much they're enjoying it and, and how much they love their shoes. And then I do from a customer that buys 10 pairs just because of the, the value that I get out of it. Um, so that the happiness factor is, is more um, is really what drives me. And that, that is the people that I have around me, obviously um, the more than, than a house or a car or, any of that stuff. I've never really been attracted to do that. I have to say that I've also had the privilege always to grow up in a safe environment where I never had to worry about any of it. Um, so I think that definitely gives you an advantage growing up that I didn't have to work to go study. It was possible for me. Um, my parents didn't struggle with money, so I didn't have to work to be able to pay the bills at home. So if you grow up in, in an environment that is kind of easy uh, in a way, for me, being happy is really not materialistic. It's purely um, the people that I have around me and looking back at a life at the end of my life where I can say, well, I followed my heart. I did the things that I love doing and didn't spend it on things um that in the at the end of the day don't really matter to mm -hmm. me no actually i was playing golf um and one of the guys that played with us he was telling me about how he had a very bad relationship with money um even though he was pretty wealthy i would uh, imagine he he was a wealthy guy he has a family um but he was telling me that growing up he didn't have like his parents were poor and all that. And he had this like a fit, like he just didn't want to be poor. And that feeling stuck with him and kept driving him even now when he's, he's wealthy enough to afford anything he wants and he can support his family. He still says that that's what drives his decision-making um, sometimes. Um, and it's just very powerful. I think what you said, um, in terms of your environment and how that kind of shapes the values that you can adopt. Um, it, it's possible to change them obviously. Um, but it's not easy. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, that's interesting. Um, if, if you were to, uh, if you were to essentially place values on three different things, how would you place that value? So if you were to essentially place a value on time, life, and money, how would you relate those things? Uh, you mean like a one, two, three position or? or... Yeah, I mean, 
you can do it however you want. You can, I guess, well, I guess we can just kind of do it with words, but um, what's more valuable to you, uh, time or money? Time. Yeah, okay. definitely now. And if, if life is a third one, life mm -hmm. is the most valuable to me, uh, and then time. And then, I mean, life and time are kind of interconnected. One is limited by the other. Um, and money, but again, that's, kind of referring to what I said before, I, mm -hmm. I think a lot of it is because I never really had to live through a shortage of it doesn't mean that I haven't been uh, haven't gone through times when there wasn't a lot of money. Uh, when I started my business, I really had to think how to spend it. Um, I'm very capable of living with a very limited amount of money. Um, but it, it never really, if, if I have to choose between time and money, I will choose time. Yes. And so is, I kind of want to like hone, uh, zone in on the, like the time and life one, because that's mm -hmm. like central to everyone, I would say. Um, because time is a, it's a measurable quantity theoretically or mathematically. Right. It's um, essentially it can be a measurable quantity of life because ev every second of your life can be measured in time. But in terms of like things, so the way I perceive it is that time is this structure or this entity and life sits within it entirely because um, you can't have life without time. And so the way I see those values playing out is that it's time is greater than or equal to life and life is greater than money. Mm -hmm. That's like how I would value it. Uh, and I think that's like possibly measurable or verifiable. <laughs> um, but what do you think about that? Um, yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, you put life is greater than or equal time right uh i or said time ti is greater than or equal to life and yeah because just as a human from a human perspective that's technically true i think yeah yeah definitely yeah it was i was just thinking that with for me you can definitely waste time too Mm -hmm. You can not use it, even if, even when you're living there, there is a way to just not go, go through time, go with the motion and don't really appreciate what you're doing with it. And I think that's something a lot of us do a lot of the time. And, and it takes, um, I, I think looking, that's one of the things when you look back on the time that you've already had, realizing what you've have and haven't done and which moments you in at maybe when you were living them didn't really realize how impactful they were going to be and and at the time didn't feel like very often in a moment you don't really know whether you're wasting the time or not sometimes you absolutely do you can even do it on purpose but most of the time you you don't really know whether those that hour or two hours or whatever you're doing is really worth going to be worth it whether it's from a business perspective whether it's from a life perspective happiness perspective um and and that makes it um sometimes very tricky at least for me to you don't really know um you build experience as you move forward in life, as you grow older, as you spend more time here having your life. Um, but if you look back at it, uh, it, it's hard to pinpoint those moments and to make sure that going forward, you will spend your time in a better way. So it's always kind of a gamble. Uh, so I totally agree with putting time first and, and mm -hmm. then life and not really knowing, uh, but that's what makes up life in the end. So yeah. the time wasted is also time. I agree. I agree. It's impossible not to waste time, especially as humans or we're not built for like precision, you know, uh, 
so I've got two more questions, two or three more questions here. Um, I guess one is more looking out to other people, but um, do you have any advice for women in general or maybe female entrepreneurs about how to leverage time um, or use time better to essentially live a happier life, live a more meaningful life or a purposeful life? Um, I don't, I don't like to generalize, but in general, women are supposedly better at multitasking and doing a lot of different things at the same time. And I'm a very much an example of that too. I'm not sure that is because of who I am or because I'm female, but I really work on a lot of different things in parallel. And I can talk to one person while doing something different. And I think that is, um, good quality, but it's also very exhausting. And knowing sometimes um, in life, understanding from the perspective of yourself and also the perspective of the person that you're dealing with, whether that's also a woman or a man, that that is not necessarily a given. Uh, it's not because you want to be super efficient and, and do a lot of things or are capable of doing all those things that other people are supposed to do that as well. And even more importantly, that you're actually, that, that you have to do that. I often see um, women, especially when they're starting a business, they, they try to be perfect at everything and be perfect at combining all of those things um, and, and do it in a very efficient way and, and give everyone the time that they deserve for getting that they need. They deserve time as well because you can't give as soon as you spend time with somebody, you're also giving part of your time to another person and to really start thinking what and who is worth spending my time with and to, and of course, the, the people that are close to you, like your children, like um, your, your partner are important. Um, but it's also, again, um, you don't have to feel like you need to give all the time that you have to them as long as it's it's a valuable amount of time and the, the, um, the time that you spend with them is quality time almost to, to use a cliche word um, that you really spend that time with them being with them and and not losing yourself because in the end that's that's going to make it even worse um, if, if you burn yourself and your time up spending it on other people. So um, mm -hmm. I see that a lot with, with women that build their careers and, and try to uh, combine that whole work and at home thing, or even women that stay at home taking care of their families, they go above and beyond often in volunteering and all the things that they try to combine. And it's not because you have the capability of doing that, that you necessarily have to do it. Uh, and it's also not because somebody else can't do that, that they're less of a person and from a judgmental point of view. It's not because, you know, other women who make a priority and say, well, I don't think it's worth my time to um, go home at three in the afternoon to pick up my kids and bring them back and then go back to work. I'll have a nanny do that, not to judge them for that either, because it's their time and that's how they want to spend it. So. Yeah, I think that's really good advice actually, because yeah, as we get older, just the responsibilities grow. Uh, and I, I guess for me, just someone as who's thought about or really like studies and works with time and thinks about it all the time. I've kind of come to that realization that I've got to be very selective about who I give time to and attention to, um, being very purposeful about that. Um, but it's not easy because people don't take it easily. Sometimes they take it the wrong way or one way or another. Um, but I, I can, I think that's really good advice. Um, and then I guess for you, um, just looking forward for the next year or two, what are you hoping to accomplish or do or, um, with in the next near future or long-term future, however you perceive that? Um, 
I don't really, I, I've never really liked the future question. <laughs> I like to, I, I do, although I do plan, uh, I think everyone who runs a business needs to write like future plans and see where you want to go, and where you evolve. But so much of what I've accomplished and done in life is because of single moments that happened that I could have never predicted. Even going to the Bay Area, it was meeting this one woman who needed some advice about shoes and randomly said, well, the Royal family is giving out grants. Maybe that is something you should apply for. And that is how I ended up here and my life completely shifted in a different direction. Uh, so that's mm. one encounter, one me being willing to spend 10, 15 minutes talking to somebody and, and helping them out um, gave a return that I could never have predicted. But if I really have to look forward um, to, to what I want to accomplish in the future, what I want to move towards is really build towards my own happiness further. And that includes shoes and, and technology, because that's what I've always been very passionate about. So that includes um, developing new products that move more towards sustainability, because I'm also very passionate about that. Um, so looking for new materials, looking for new technologies, how to make this industry, the fashion industry, which is kind of crumbling, especially after the pandemic, um, and, and use technology to not save it, that would be too heroic, but somehow make it a little bit better. Um, because we all wear clothes, we all wear shoes, and, and it's going to keep existing. Um, but we need to keep doing that in a way that that is sustainable for our planet and, and also makes us improve in life. Nobody imagines having a phone now that is 20 years old, yet we wear cl clothing and shoes that are 100 years old, not in actual the way they're made. So just that, that discrepancy in, in evolution, and that's always triggered me. So I want to be a part of that. That's also why I started this company. Uh, and I want to keep doing that. And then it includes just staying up to date on all the cool things that are happening in the tech world, in the science world, and, and see where applications keeping my eyes open, uh, different fields, different. I like to switch between different industries just to get to know uh, as much as many people and, and ways of solving problems as possible to so then maybe find a problem that will make somebody's life better. I don't want to find a problem. I don't want to start a company and build a big company to make myself rich. I want to really find something that makes a difference in somebody's life. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think if you just do what you do well and you keep doing it well, I think people will pay you anyway. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're coming to the end of this hour here um, and I've actually really just enjoyed just listening to you and just hearing everything um, do you have any questions for me about time or anything <laughs> uh, uh, no I think I should read your book but <laughs> other than that no I, I think that's that's where I should start and then I'll let you know if I have any questions okay okay well thank you so much for coming on the show today um, I, I hope you have a really good time in Aruba. Um, it'd be hard not to, I imagine. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'm looking forward yes. to hearing people's reactions and seeing how it goes.